and welcome to another episode of Red Panda Rees. Reels. Same thing. In between being a goofball around my partner and fawning over yaoi protagonists, I like to question all the ways in which my family is strange and how all that led me to being a creature full of contradictions. One way I do that is by watching movies tackling themes of family relations and obsessively self-inserting and overanalyzing how much better off or worse off I'd be today if I were a character in one of those movies. Today, we're looking at some Koreeda movies, arguably the best what-if family scenarios you could come across. Roll intro! Now, this might sound strange coming from a person talking about movies and anime to strangers on the internet, but I don't watch a lot of movies. I don't watch movies I don't think I'm going to like, and I basically require my movie-loving partner to try to sell me on every single flick we watch. But there's one type of movie he can always count on me to be in the mood for, and that's family dramas. In my biased opinion, Asian cinema is ages ahead of Western cinema in their portrayal of family relationships. Many directors explore this theme time and time again, and perhaps the most popular director doing so in Japan is Hirokazu Koreeda, a former documentary filmmaker who branched off into the work of fiction. The first time I watched a Koreeda film was in 2018 with Shoplifters. I loved that movie so gosh darn much, I rewatched it with my roommates just a few weeks later. As they complained about the bleak tone, I was vigorously shaking in my seat running through a simulation of how I could fit in such a family. I was upset I didn't hear more people talking about it aside from film enthusiasts, which I never considered myself to be, so they were kind of intimidated to talk to, honestly. And I was even more upset that the Academy Awards decided to give the Oscar for Best Foreign Film to a movie that was far less deserving of it. I don't even want to say his title, so here's the poster. Hey, at least he got the Palm d'Or. Congratulations, friends. You did something right. In watching more of Koreeda's films, I was reminded not only of the work of Ozu, but also that of Mamoru Hosoda. Like Hosoda, Koreeda continues to explore a singular concept. What defines a family, and how can the interactions of families differ, in increasingly new and creative ways? For your viewing pleasure, I'll be looking at three of his movies today. Nobody Knows, Like Father, Like Son, and Shoplifters. Well, let's start with the most depressing film of the bunch, and one based on a true story at that. Nobody Knows. The story follows four children, Akira, Kyoko, Shigeru, and Yuki, and their mother Keiko. The family moves into a small apartment in Tokyo, but only Akira, the elder child, is known to the landlord. Shigeru and Yuki, the youngest boy and girl, have to be brought in through separate suitcases, while Kyoko, the oldest sister, arrives on her own. Right away, Keiko makes it clear to her children that none of them are allowed to be seen by others except for Akira. That means no school, no friends, and no outside activities. But despite all of that, things seem happy in this family. Somehow. Things quickly change, however, when Keiko leaves home for a few months, forcing the family to scrape by with the meager funds she leaves behind. The mother returns, telling Akira she has a new boyfriend, and when they marry, the children can have a normal life. But this time, Keiko does not return. And she never will. Why not just go to social services? Akira explains early on that a similar experience has happened to the family before, and it ended badly for everyone involved. This time, he doesn't want the family torn apart, even as food runs out, relationships deteriorate, and money becomes non-existent. Koreeda's approach to this film is not exactly movie-like, or even scripted. His documentary background helps ground this movie deep into reality, making us an uninvolved observer, or like a fly in the wall in these kids' lives. For a film that relies almost entirely on the work of the child actors, Koreeda did a phenomenal job in bringing out their performances. None of the children were professional actors and widely varied in age. But in spite of those limitations, they all did a tremendous job, and I can't praise them enough. Especially the work of the actor playing Akira, Yuya Yagira. As months pass in the film, the story doesn't devolve into a cliché melodrama about the kids. Instead, we see them just be kids. They play games, they watch TV, they try to find a way to kill time, and try to get along with each other. Even as their apartment becomes more and more of a prison cell to them, their innocence doesn't completely fade away. But poor Akira isn't so lucky like his siblings. Because he's now the surrogate head of the family, he has to do whatever it takes to make sure his siblings are taken care of. One of the biggest questions the movie asks us is to think, is Keiko a sympathetic figure or a villain? It's a difficult question to answer. There is no doubt that her actions are horrible and have horrible consequences for her children. She's a prime example of the narcissistic adult. Obsessed with her own happiness and fading looks, thinking issues will be fixed by spending money she doesn't have, wearing fashionable clothes and accessories while her children are in rags. And through all this, she refuses to take responsibility as a parent. But somehow, there's something pitiable about her. 
Akira finds her crying in her sleep one night, and while it's never specifically addressed, it's suggested that she's dealing with some major issues. Definitely some mental issues! That would explain why, even as a grown woman, she is very childlike. She acts and talks like one of her children, and not in a play act or forced way either. Keiko is not the only target of criticism. Very few, if any, adults or grown-up figures in the film are respectable. They are either unable to help or could care less about their predicament. The neighbors don't even notice the mother is gone. In fact, the landlord doesn't seem the least bit interested in their plight. It's only when the rent and bills are unpaid that they come to the apartment, and even then, nothing. The greatest tragedy of Nobody Knows is not the fact that these children are alone or even the losses they're put through. No, it's the fact that nobody knows of their situation because they don't want to know. It's something they force in the back of their mind as they go about their lives. And yet, the film is not devoid of hope, as surprising as that might seem. Even as Akira struggles to keep things together, he does the best that he can to give his siblings purpose and the hope that all is not lost. Through thick and thin, they will have to stay together, and because of that, the movie manages to affect us even more. When the happy moments come, and yes, there are a few here, it really does bring a smile to your face. But as soon as those scenes are over, the scenes coming after hit us even harder. That's something you would never be able to replicate in a more traditional drama. Nobody Knows isn't what I would call an enjoyable movie. It's bleak, arduous, and a bit on the long side, but it's nonetheless a journey well worth taking. It's the kind of movie that reminds me personally how much damage simple apathy towards others can cause. Like Father Like Son focuses on two families of completely different social backgrounds and beliefs who are brought together after an incident involving their children. Ryota Nonomiya is a workaholic architect who seems pretty content with his life. His wife Midori handles the house and takes care of their son Keita while he's at work. Although he doesn't spend as much time with his family as he should, Ryota sees no need to switch things up. Why should he? His apartment is a damn good one right in the city, and at home it's always peaceful. Naturally, things can't stay like this forever. The day comes when the family receives a phone call telling them that the hospital where Keita was born needs to speak with them. There, they learn one of the worst things a parent can hear. Keita is not their actual son. A mix-up when he was born meant that their biological son was given to another family. Enter Yukari and Yurai Saiki, small town folks who couldn't be further away from the Nonomiya's wealth and status. They're also pretty interested in mooching off as much of the financial settlement that the hospital will give them. Now, what to do with the children, Keita and Ryusei? Both families have to come to the biggest decision of their lives. Do they keep the children they've raised as their own, or do they exchange them for their biological sons? Nonomiya is pretty adamant on getting Ryusei, and possibly keeping Keita, but the others aren't really sure what is the best choice here. But as Nonomiya gets to know the psyches more and more, he begins to realize what actually makes someone, well, their child. After starting the video off with a rather emotionally draining film, Like Father Like Son shifts things to a somewhat more light-hearted mood. That doesn't mean we get comedy here, but things aren't so doom and gloom. The psyches, particularly Yudai, are a bit on the goofy side, but not to an unrealistic extent. They're still fully fleshed out characters with their own lives and ambitions. This works to help contrast the psyches and the nonomias without relying solely on dialogue or narration to establish the differences between them. Watching their opposite parenting styles, we as viewers are posed with the question of what makes a good father, and by extension, does being related by blood automatically make you the child's parent? From the very first scene, we understand what kind of father Nonomiya is. His sole focus is on success, and he forces those standards on Keita as well. Keita has to attend a top-tier elementary school, learn to play the piano, and be as quiet as he can while his father is at home. Yet his father isn't really there for him, especially for a boy his age. But because Nonomiya is able to afford them all a very comfortable lifestyle, he thinks that he's automatically a good father. Koreda mentioned in an interview that he wanted viewers to initially side with Nonomiya and be against Saiki as a father, but I never got that impression personally. Sure, Saiki does lead a much poorer life and doesn't seem to take things seriously, but he's pretty smart when it comes to his work, and he's extremely close with all the members of his family. What is important, as Koreda notes, is how Nonomiya's change is central to the entire movie. He starts as a very pompous and uptight man, but as the story unfolds, his confidence breaks down and he's forced to confront the fact that he wasn't really there for Keita. Seeing a man who thinks he's a great parent on status alone come to terms with the ugly truth is very powerful. And Koreda does so without seeming too sentimental or too fake. And taking glimpses of each family's own life helps to further ground this idea. 
Keita has adopted some of the characteristics of Nonomiya, while Ryusei has taken on several traits from the psyches. The two boys may look like their biological fathers, but that doesn't mean they've automatically become just like them, even though Nonomiya thinks that will happen eventually. A deep and loving bond between parent and child is not something that can be simply bought. It requires constant effort and presence in the child's life. You can't be emotionally distant like Nonomiya is and think things will go perfectly. This movie hit different for me because I was also not raised by my biological parents as a young child despite knowing who my parents were and meeting them now and then. When I had more chances to spend time with them as a teenager, somehow that connection was much harder to forge. I consider the people who actually raised me my parents, and I was incredibly conflicted about whose child I actually was. I grew up happy and I didn't miss anything, but to this day I avoid calling anyone mom or dad. This movie is a great mirror into how Keita and Ryusei and their respective parents struggle with the same issue I always had. Like Father Like Son is the most optimistic film of the three, but is not sappy in the least. It's often very funny and heartwarming, but still manages to make us think and understand the turmoil the characters are going through, without seeming forced. If you're done crying your eyes out with nobody knows, then this is where you'll regain some hope in humanity. At least for a short bit. What happens when you take the previous two films and mash them together? Well, you might end up with shoplifters. The story here focuses on the life and times of a very peculiar family. And when I say family, I might mean it in the loosest sense of the word. If you were to take a look at such a group of five in real life, you'd be confused at how to classify them at first. There's Osamu, the father, who works as a day laborer but is forced to leave after twisting his ankle. The mother, Nobuyo, works for an industrial laundry service which has begun to cut away hours for its employees. Aki, the aunt, works for a peep show business. Shota, the son, helps Osamu shoplift, communicating with each other through a system of hand signals. And Hatsue, the grandmother, owns the home the family lives in and supports them all through her long-deceased husband's pension. Their place is a bit of a... mess, to put it lightly. Trash. But just like Akira and his siblings and nobody knows, the family seems happy enough despite their circumstances. One night, Osamu and Shota come across a young girl named Yuri, who has been locked out of her home once again. They invite her to their home for dinner, but upon seeing signs of abuse, they decide to keep her there. Hey, it's not kidnapping if you're not asking for a ransom, right? But sure enough, as Yuri ingrains herself as a new member of the family, now going by the name Lin, the authorities learn about her disappearance. As hard as the family tries, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep their secret under wraps. While working on Like Father Like Son, Correra was interested in further exploring the film's central themes. This time, however, he wanted to decide whether we can form a family beyond blood relations. Shoplifters takes a few cues from both Nobody Knows and Like Father Like Son in that it is also another home drama, but takes a different path in doing so. Unlike in those earlier films, Shoplifters isn't told from a singular point of view. Instead, every member of the family is given equal focus. We not only see how the children interact with each other and the adults and vice versa, but also how each member interacts with the rest of society. Correra again looks back to like father like son in asking us what actually makes one a parent. Is it the simple fact that you gave birth to a child or are biologically theirs? Or do you have to actively pursue such a title through love and affection? A few of the characters and shoplifters seem to have the idea worked out in their mind, but were not automatically led to agree with them. It's an interesting bit of irony, isn't it? The fake family that has to steal, lie, and cheat to make ends meet is the happier and more loving one to Yuri than her actual family. But in a way, isn't that what many families are in the end? Just a group of people helping each other through thick and thin. Before a couple marries, they're unrelated. And if they adopt a child, they're three unrelated people who choose to be there for each other. It's definitely one way of looking at what makes a family. When the film comes to a close, it's not the happy ending we've come to expect, but it's not a downer either. While things will never be the same for the family, their lives have significantly changed from their experiences and the slightest ray of hope still shines through. The final message that Shoplifters leaves us with is a very impactful one, and one that many people should take to heart. You might not get to choose who your family is, but finding who you really belong to is a decision that we all have to make for ourselves. As I've mentioned previously, I'm someone who has always struggled with defining a family and determine who I belong with. One thing these movies expose is that families can bring joy and comfort, but can also be sad and depressing. Most everyone has a family they are born into and a family they choose for themselves. Ideally, the two overlap, but sometimes they don't, and that's okay too. Similarly, parenting is a skill like any other. 
Through different ways of parenting, we can do lots of good and lots of bad. And although some parents might not be ready to parent the children they brought into the world, others are ready to be parents to children who are not biologically their own. When two such parents meet, lots of interesting conversations can be had. Lastly, you don't need to be rich or successful to be a good parent. In most cases, all you need to do is be there. And as a formerly conflicted child myself, in my experience, being there really is the most important thing of all. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.